Good evening, you're watching Estuary TV News. Coming up tonight, a triathlon in Scunthorpe aiming to get children active. And this just in, a suspicious UFO landing at Swanland Primary School. And my guest tonight is Jeff Sargison, a director of Beverly Folk Festival, who is here to tell us about the names appearing this year. Welcome to SU TV News, I'm Richard Morris, but first it's over to Erica Barker for all the news headlines. The investigation continues into the death of a man from knife injuries in Grimsby. 69-year-old John Smith was found dead on his doorstep in Camforth Crescent shortly after 6.30 in the morning on Bank Holiday Monday. And beside police say they are treating the incident as suspicious but as yet unexplained and are making extensive inquiries to establish events leading up to the death of Mr Smith. The largest ever survey into crime and antisocial behaviour in rural areas has been launched. The National Rural Crime Network is urging people to give their views on policing in their community. It aims to assess how crime, as well as the threat of potential crime, affects individuals both financially and emotionally. There is more information on this on the Lincolnshire Police website. People in Humberston are being encouraged to take an active role within the community. The Good Neighbours event held at Wendover Hall featured local charities and services, urging people to engage in more social and physical activities. Representatives hope this is just the start of a wider initiative in North East Lincolnshire. It's about encouraging people to be good neighbours. We did a lot of work last year where older people said to us, they thought that we'd lost neighbourliness. And this is about encouraging people to be good neighbours, to help each other and to get involved in activities in their community. Today's just the start. We'd like to encourage people to come along, to get involved. We'll be looking to organise regular activities here in Humberston. And Humberston's just the start of, uh, of spreading this approach right across North East Lincolnshire. And there has been four-legged fun today at the Meridian Showground in Cleethorpes with dog competitions and exhibits, aiming to promote North East Lincolnshire Council's Poo Lucian campaign and raise awareness of responsible ownership within the borough. I think the important thing is, the is that to, with your, your dogs, make sure that, that you pick up each and every time, um, which I know the majority of people do, but sadly there are still many, many people that don't. And, you know, certainly in public areas like this, OK, we can walk around and, and not be afraid. We're not going to step in any dog poo today, you know, but that should be the same wherever we go. And until next time, that's all from the news. Tata Steel in Scunthorpe is one of the area's, if not the area's, largest employer. Now, across the country, they're travelling to various venues and inspiring children to take part in triathlons. On the rainiest possible day to hold a partially outdoor event, I went along to find out more. Triathlons have gained success in the British public's eye since competitions featuring Olympians of nationwide recognition. Now, Tata Steel, as part of their charitable work, is hoping that they can inspire the next generation into getting out and being active. Mike Jubb is from the British Triathlon Trust. For some reason, kids love doing triathlon, yeah? And I think it could be the aspect of the fact that you've got three small elements, so that it keeps their engagement throughout the whole experience. So rather than saying to a child, go out and run for 20 minutes, you just say, look, go out there and do a, and do a small element and do a small part of it. One yeah. that the kids love is the fact there's no getting changed in between. It's straight through. So the kids get out of the swimming pool here and they put their T-shirts on over the top of their swimming costume, come out here, we give them a bike and a helmet, and uh, off they go on their bike and they, they're doing it all with a with, you know, soaking wet. <laughs> yes, well, um, we've had a relationship with the British Triathlon Federation since 2006. We ran our first Tata Kids of Steel events, um, triathlon events in 2007, and you know, nine years later here we are, you know, continue with the, continuing with them. Um, for us, um, it's about showing these kids here today how fun it is to be healthy and active, introducing them to a new sport, and you know, working with the community to, to do something good for you know the people in the areas in which we operate. You're watching Estuary TV News. Coming up later in the programme, that UFO landing at Swanland Primary School Triathlon. will bring you all the details. And Dan Kemp will be back with the Sports News Roundup. I want to see Grimsby put on the map. 
extraordinary qualities unmatched in anywhere else in Britain. We need to act with one voice. I was absolutely shocked, I'll tell you the truth. More police officer hours spent on patrol preventing crimes from happening. It's been running for 32 years and is a three-day celebration of music, workshops and tradition. I'm talking, of course, about the Beverly Folk Festival, which is back next month. Joining me on the sofa is Jeff Sargison, a director of the festival. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> Uh, very well, I'm very excited about the upcoming festival, less than four weeks to go. I'm glad to hear it. So tell us a little bit sort of about the history of it. I mean, obviously it's been running over 30 years, so tell us sort of how it got started and that kind of thing. Well, I wasn't involved in the start of it, but I do have an idea of how it began. It began with a, a folk club in Beverly called, uh, which was at Nellie's, the traditional pub there, the old pub uh, of, of repute, and it was called the, the, the uh, White Horse Folk Club. And things developed from the folk club and they started putting on other events in the town and the idea of a festival emerged. But it was a town festival without a particular venue. Various pubs were used. There was Morris dancing in the streets. There was concerts at the old Picture Playhouse, now a fashion store. Uh, concerts at uh, various places in the town. And gradually the whole thing coalesced and it moved to a site. And the site was the leisure centre in Beverly which proved eff effective and the, the festival grew more uh, and eventually grew so much that it outgrew the leisure centre. So four or five years ago uh, as the leisure centre was starting to pinch the idea emerged that we needed to look for another site. We looked around the area and we looked at all sorts of sites but we decided that one thing was, was sacrosanct and that was the name of Beverly by which the festival had become associated. So we, while we had possible sites elsewhere, we stuck to the idea of Beverly and came up with the, the, the plan for the race course, which we eventually became reality. Yeah, I mean, obviously, and you were talking there about how much it's grown. I mean, it's become such a huge part of, of the town, really. I mean, how have you made sure that it's sort of stayed true to its roots when something like this has grown sort of exponentially? Well, there are elements of the festival still in the town. Uh, for example, they'll be uh, dancing in the streets, to coin a phrase, with something like 15 or 20 Morris dance teams. And uh, the, the pubs, several pubs, three to, three to be sure, uh, also have folk nights, folk events on, independently of the festival, but just adding to the general atmosphere. And one of the complaints from the public about moving to the race course is it's out of town, because it's what? It must be quarter of a mile, half a mile perhaps, uh, out of the main centre of Beverly. So what we've done is we have a, a bus uh, and we run a bus route continually while ever the festival's on, which goes from the race course into town, around town, back to the race course and back again continuously. So you can hop on the bus for a small token price and nip into town to do your shopping or to visit one of the pubs and get back to the festival pretty promptly. Of course, talking about the festival growing, you, you've had all kinds of, sort of interesting things taking place there. And one of them was a giant war horse made out of glass milk bottles. Yes. So tell me a little bit about sort of how that, how that came to be. That sounds like a very intriguing <laughs> little sort of n nugget of information. Well, I should say first that it's not just a folk festival. We, we encompass all manner of pursuits. Uh, there, there's comedy, there, there's uh, uh, dip, dipping our toes into the arts, we have poetry, we have literature events, uh, and we have community events. And last year a community ev event involving people from all over Beverly was, was a presentation uh, of War Horse, coinciding of course with the outbreak of the First World War. And we have a relationship over the last few years with uh, Michael Morpurgo, who of course created War Horse. The, the, the show, uh, the book, okay. the play, yep, yep, yep. And, uh, and he collaborated with us in devising a production uh, of War Horse, especially for Beverly Festival, and one of the community efforts that went into it was to create a War Horse, which I, I wasn't involved in the creation of it, but I did see it on Sunday morning at the festival last year, and boy was it impressive. And it's, I mean, you're talking there about how it's not just kind of a folk festival, it's become this kind of like all over culture festival almost, so why is it important that our region has events like this? Well, it is a folk festival first and foremost, and I, I think that the, uh, the arts side of it 
could be best be described as the fringe rather than the, the main focus. Uh, but people who go to a folk festival, they're not just interested in folk. Uh, you can expand that theory by saying that folk music itself is a very elastic medium and there's all manner of musical events taking place that come under the umbrella of folk. And so tell me a little bit, I mean, obviously you're, you're run pretty much mostly by volunteers, aren't you, as yes. well? So how do they sort of like all get together and how do you organise all of that? Well, volunteers is a crucial part of the festival. Uh, I mean, I was amazed when I joined the uh, board of directors uh, second time round a year or so ago to find that we need, over the weekend, 200 volunteers fulfilling all sorts of roles from uh, stewarding, from taking the tickets at the door, uh, from looking after the artists, from looking after the, the campsite, the car park, rubbish collection. Uh, it's a massive job. 200 volunteers all working under team leaders uh, and we have to find them. Now there are lots who've been coming for years who come to the festival. They don't get anything for it other than a, a, a ticket for the festival. And, and camping, so that's their that's our contribution to their efforts. But they do get to come to the festival and have a role. Uh, but we need festival volunteers constantly, and I still think there there are some vacancies. We're still short of a few for this year. And if people want to go on our website, uh, beverlyfestival.co.uk, uh, there there there's a route to uh, applying to be a volunteer at this year's festival. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jeff. Don't go anywhere. We're going to um, come back to you in just a moment, and we're going to talk all about the acts taking part this year. Okay. And next up, we're getting some breaking reports of a UFO crash. It's believed the incident happened at Swanland Primary School, around six miles west of Hull. I'm only getting some vague details at the moment, but I think our, our reporter Dan Kemp has just managed to make it to the scene. Swanland Primary Academy has been the scene of a serious incident. Children arrived at the school to discover an alien spacecraft had crash-landed on the school field. An emergency assembly was called, and here's what some of the pupils made of the scene. I'm a bit confused where it came from, but I th we had thunder and lightning last night, so I think it's been hit and land crashed here. My mum got a message and, and it said something's weird happening in the playground. I believe in it and I don't, because some of my friends have been saying that it's made out of cardboard, but I don't think it is. Um, I was a bit excited and nervous. Oh. I thought it wasn't real at first, but then everybody was, like, screaming. But just in case any real UFO hunters are watching, this was indeed a hoax. The school put the event on to encourage creativity in the classroom, as executive head teacher Chris Huscroft explains. We've started a project um, um, called The Alien Invasion, and it's basically to infuse children about writing. Um, obviously, lots of the, the curriculum is revolves around writing, but what we've tried to do is make it a first-hand experience for children, where you know something obviously is a stimulus, it um, enthuses them, exciting. So a text message went out at 8 o'clock this morning to parents, which caused quite a bit of um, intrigue. Um, got a lot more people here, um, and obviously for the children it's been a really, really exciting and uh, um, eventful um, start to the day. We thought an, the, the alien would engage all children of all ages and then that gives us scope to write about loads of different things and do lots of different acti activities that we could then expand uh, their writing. South Hunsley Academy have been in the project too. Drama students from the secondary school attended the emergency assembly to recall their close encounters of a third kind. Obviously there's been quite a lot of planning has gone into um, the day and, and getting it all organised and we've worked really closely with South Hunsley. So lots of phone calls, conversations and you kind of forget that the, uh, the children haven't been aware of any of this up until uh, first thing this morning. Um, so yeah, it has been really tricky but um, definitely very exciting for all of us involved as well. And pupils have been taking part in activities for the rest of the day around the aliens' visit. The aliens have been friendly, so we're doing a poster to see if uh, the aliens would come back and see us and people would get them and don't capture them and uh, don't scream and don't uh, close their doors on them. Don't be nasty to us and uh, don't use slime everywhere all the time. So uh, we would like to say thank you for the aliens doing things for us instead of redoing them, things for them. 
Well, fortunately, it looks as though no one has been injured from that crash landing. But of course, we'll keep you up to date as that story develops. Still with me in the studio is Jeff Sargison, acting chairman of the Beverly Folk Festival. And earlier, we were talking about the beginnings of the festival um, and a little bit about the history of it. So tell me about, you know, looking, looking towards the future, tell me about who's taking part this year. Have you got sort of any favourite acts coming up? Absolutely. Lots of my favourites, as well as the, the public's favourites, I hope. Uh, my own view, uh, the, the line-up this year, is it's the, the best one I can remember. And it's in various sections, although not intended to be in sections, in that there are lots of new acts, emerging acts, exciting acts. There, there's Americana acts, there, there's traditional folk acts, there's headliners, there's what we're calling folk legends. I mean, to mention them, for example, on the last night of the festival, Sunday the 21st of June, we have Ralph McTell, a name from uh, way back, but still very popular and well-remembered. We have Barbara Dixon, who's... Uh, uh, very few folk acts can claim to have had several number one chart hits, but Barbara has. And a name that is probably unknown to many people, but one of the greatest guitarists this country's ever produced, Wiz Jones, who's been a legend since the late 50s and was the inspiration for guitarists like Keith Richard in the Rolling Stones and Eric Clapton, all learned at his feet. So obviously we've got some local people, but also tell us about some of the more sort of international people taking part as well. Well, I suppose the, the top international act would be a, a band with an intriguing name, Hasey Dixie. And if that sounds a little bit like a, 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 a heavy metal band from way back, there is a, a more of a hint of them in it. In fact, you could describe them as sort of heavy metal bluegrass folk. And they're, they're an American act, and their version of... Um, Bohemian Rhapsody has to be seen and heard to be believed. They are stupendous and are already pro proving a big attraction. We've also got one of the, uh, the stars of the current English traditional scene in Seth Lakeman, who's been uh, uh, doing incredibly well over the last few, uh, few years. At uh, the other end of the scale, uh, we have acts from the locale. Uh, one of my favourites in particular, a whole band, is uh, the Hillbilly Troupe making their debut at the Folk Festival, and they're a sort of cross between Lonnie Donegan and a punk act. So uh, uh, we're going to start showing the photos to those um, viewers now at home whilst, whilst you're talking. So tell us a little bit you know, more about s some of the local acts. I mean, how do, you, how do you source them? How do you find them to take part in the festival? I think you could say that they find us. Right. Because we would probably book um, 30 or 40 uh, acts, professional acts for the festival, but we also have areas of the festival devoted to local acts uh, e and younger acts. There is a, 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 a group of uh, performers who play under the title of the Westwood Sessions. We have a, an area of the festival called Area 2, which is uh, uh, emerging and semi-pro acts, mostly from the area. And there are lots of opportunities from people at all levels of the folk game to find a place at the festival. And in terms of finding sort of international acts as well, do they, do they, do they find you? Or or do you go and find them? But you know, is is the it's Beverly Folk Festival both, is, it, is, it, is it that well known across the pond? Say? Oh yeah, I mean, the, although there are vast numbers of festivals, I mean, the 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 current figure for folk festivals in Britain is up in the three hundreds now. Uh, some fall by the wayside each, each year, and uh, aspiring folk club organisers uh, create new festivals. Uh, so it's a moving, a moving object. And just, uh, just out of interest, you're going to hate me for asking this question, but when do you start planning for next year? I mean, obviously you're looking forward to next month's event, but when, when once all that's died down, when do you start looking at you know 26? Plans are already in hand, and what we're looking for at the moment, and no, nothing will be revealed until the festival. But we hope to be able to announce one or two big name acts for. 2016 at this year's festival. So obviously next year's festival as well going to be full of local talent hopefully. Well it will of course and the local talent then moves up the scale and some of the local talent will be no doubt appearing in a, a, a another role. And just before we run out of time can you just give us um, the contact details again and how people can still get in touch and get tickets and that kind the of thing. The best way to contact us if for anything at all volunteering or buying tickets is our website Beverly Festival on, on Google will find us. And the festival takes place from the 19th to the 21st of June, Friday to Sunday, with the extra added ingredient of our opening night pre-festival concert on the race course, featuring the incredible bootleg Beatles. Sounds, sounds brilliant. Sounds brilliant. Thank you so much for coming in, Jeff. Um, th uh, thank you, Jeff. And Beverly Folk Festival, as Jeff was just saying, runs from the 19th of June to the 21st at the town's race course. Now it's time to see if you too can guess the word at home. That's fine. 
It's silent, it's raining. It's raining. Oh, there you go. Raining fast, Dad. It's chucking it down. It's raining fast. Uh, it's raining hard. Um, it's, it's, it's raining cats and dogs. Rain. Siren it down means it's absolutely belting it down with rain. Raining. It's raining. It's raining. Pouring. Pers persisting down. <laughs> <laughs> Being polite. Raining. Being down. Raining. Siren down. Yeah, I've been chucking it down with rain. And now here's Dan Kemp with all the sports news. Following their relegation, Hull City have begun to arrange their squad for next season. The Tigers have announced the release of fullback Liam Rossini. The defender played for the club from October 2010 and made 161 appearances, including a start in last season's FA Cup final. Paul McShane, Alex Bruce and Stephen Quinn are all also out of contract in the summer, but the club are yet to announce if they will be staying. John Paul Pittman has become the second player to sign a new deal with Grimsby Town. He made 35 appearances for the Mariners last season, scoring 11 goals and commits to the club after Craig Disley penned a new one-year deal. Scunthorpe United's new signing Jack King has been a previous target for the club. That's according to the Iron Boss Mark Robbins, who's brought the Preston North End defender in as his second summer signing. He was part of the Lily White squad that gained promotion to the Championship at the playoff final on Sunday and joined Stephen Dawson at Glamford Park. Hull Kingston Rovers have signed experienced prop Tony Pula 2 on loan until the end of the season. The former New Zealand and Samoan international has joined the Robins from Super League rivals Salford Red Devils and is expected to make his debut on Saturday's derby against Hull FC at Newcastle's Magic Weekend. Pula 2 will bring more size and experience to the Rovers pack and joins James Greenwood as the club's second addition in a week. And finally, we can expect news on Hull's big fight between Luke Campbell and Tommy Coyle next week. Matchroom boxing promoter Eddie Hearn confirmed the news on his Twitter account this morning. It's been suggested that the homegrown pair could face off in July at the KC Stadium and we'll bring you news on all the details when we get them. And that's all for the sport. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Don't forget, if you do want to go along to the Beverly Folk Festival, it is running between the 19th of June to the 21st at the Beverly Town Race Course. Thank you very much for coming in today, Jeff. If you've got a story for us, then please do go to our Facebook or Twitter pages. Details are on the screen. If you search Estuary TV in either of those, you'll be able to find them. Or you can email news at estuary.tv or you can telephone at Grimsby 01472 31553. Until tomorrow, Good evening. Estuary TV's weather, sponsored by Hornsby's, celebrating 100 years in buses. Hello and welcome to Estuary TV's weather. A breezy day with some good sunny spells, but also a few blustery rain showers at times, mainly in the afternoon, with maximum temperatures of 14 degrees. Further sunshine and showers on Friday. Estuary TV's weather, sponsored by Hornsby's, celebrating 100 years in buses.